transition and change in our country led me to question my role as an artist over time. I see the work I do as a process involving inquiry and exploration that is often prompted by a response to context. I regard this as a method of responsiveness to people, to places and events, and to various forms of information. In 1997, for a project in the, at the informal Muti market under the M2 highway at Faraday Station in Johannesburg, I participated in the design and consultation of, cub of, of consulta sorry, design and construction of consultation cubicles for traditional healers, spaces that would afford some pr privacy in the public area. It was one of the earliest proje urban projects that I was involved in, and it still represents for me the uniqueness of our environment as well as the challenges we face within a period of transition and change. The positive responses to the project, in particular from the traditional healers, encouraged me to see, the tr see transition as a prompt for doing things differently, to persist in finding creative solutions. Evolution was the conceptual prompt and subject for a project in the cradle of humankind informing the architecture and landscaping of the overall scheme. As exciting and inspiring as this was for me, the ideas for the implementation of art into the scheme were quite conventional. This is a sketch visual visualizing a bird's eye view of a structure represented by the red diagonal lines that is casting shadows onto the ground. I felt compelled to respond with something that would spark the imagine, imagination, bringing the traces of human evolution to life. The model shown here incorporates various hominid outlines from different stages of evolution, radiating out from primate to modern human. They are scaled and arranged to form a three-dimensional head. Here is the sum of us, installed on site in the cradle of humankind. My response to the phenomenon of evolution. Considering the immense significance of gold mining in South Africa, Whilst I was driving through a mining region en route to the venue of an exhibition I was preparing for, I questioned, what if I used the gold price to try and map out my life, to try to represent my entire existence? As a response to this question and imagining a very large work, I built this model. It is based on graphs of the gold price over a period of 37 years, with the intention of realizing it for the exhibition at a scale of one meter per year. I decided to turn the graph upside down to comment on the precariousness of market value and the impact this has on our existence. The peaks and valleys of the fluctuating graph suddenly took on a new resonance for me as they came to re represent value in terms of people's lives. The graph is propped up on s with skinny gum poles as a reference to the methods of mining and the inherent dangers, dangers in this involves. Graphs of the birth and death rates of the world divided into 11 regions inform the work in the middle of this image. It's called come and go and is constructed of laminated burnt plywood. The graphs represent a period of 18 years from the ground up at a scale of 10 centimeters per year, so the sculpture is approximately the height of a person. The front of the sculpture represents the birth rates of the 11 regions arranged in vertical lines from left to right. The graphs have been morphed into each other to create a statistical geography. Sub-Saharan Africa is on the center line, and the death rates for all regions are represented on the reverse side of the sculpture, which you can't see from this view. From this angle, you can see the difference between Sub-Saharan Africa on the left, which has the highest birth and death rates, and Western Europe on the right. The extreme rates for Sub-Saharan Africa results in a wide supportive base without which the sculpture would probably fall over. This sadly seems to illustrate the global reliance on e economic inequality. The burnt wood exposes carbon as a common denominator, suggesting a unity of sorts. The person that the form was supposed to suggest looks rather more like the trunk of a tree. These seven heads are morphed from three portraits of my parents and myself as a play on genetics and origin. The surfaces look like ocean waves, but are in fact 
created from the topographical coordinates of a strip of land running from the Fredefort Dome to the Stagfantine Caves in the Cradle of Humankind. Millions of years ago, the meteorite that hit the Fredefort region impacted the Earth so hard that the ground rippled like water. I amplified the topography on each head as a reenactment of this drama, like a series of movie stills. So what started as a curious exploration of familial genetic relationships came to re represent for me a broader, more universal portraiture of humankind and shared origin. The Mind's Vine is a sculpture about the complexity of wine in the broadest sense. It presents data in a three-dimensional form that can literally be read as text within a spatial experience. Instead of grapes and leaves, the, the four vines hold numerous texts and stories about the complexity of wine. Art and history, religion and mythology, geography and science, polit politics and slavery. But the most, Im most importantly, this dense construction of form and text is a response to the very complex relationship between language and sensory perception. These conceptual sketches explore Africa's origin, as a seed, as potential. They were created in response to a commission by a global bank based in Africa. The banking premise of investment, growth, and return led, to me, led me to think of Africa as a representation of origin, growth, and potential. Seed is a 34 meter tall suspended sculpture made up of plywood panels which are pigmented with soil collected from various countries around Africa. From some angles, the sculpture evokes a spiral or a helix, and from some views, it seems to be encapsulated within a sphere of reflective panels. Is it radiating or is it fractured? The hundreds of plywood panels are detailed with cut-out drawings of characters, as well as translations of different maps, representing political terrains, population densities, topography, and mineral resources. When you enter the building, Africa starts to emerge and is present for a moment, acknowledging the troubled histories endured and the many challenges facing our, the continent. But most importantly, it poses questions around growth and potential. Basketball versus football is situated in Hillbrow, a densely, later, a densely populated area of Johannesburg. I documented young people playing football and basketball at the park, and the resulting work is a playful response to this. I combined and arranged the profiles to construct a duel between these two sports, like a series of action stills, using color to suggest an urban camouflage of sorts, a device for survival in the concrete jungle. This responsiveness of documenting and, and presenting people in their daily lives is also an exploration into the identities and roles of popular culture in an emerging African democracy. To the opposite end of the public spectrum is South Africa's monument known as the Freedom Park. How do we celebrate unity, diversity, as well as acknowledge the complexities of history? This ambitious project was the result of a process, years of research, debate and design involving a wide spectrum of people from different disciplines and backgrounds. The Freedom Park has a very different ethos to the Fortrecker Monument, which asserts itself on top of a nearby hill. The reflective steel columns, named the reeds, represent the conduits between human life and ancestral heritage. They evolve out of the land, lightly touching the sky. The collaborative process of learning from and working with others has had a meaningful impact on my understanding of working in the public realm. This is exemplified in the next project, which developed over a number of years. In collaboration with the architect Jeremy Rose, we questioned, how do you portray and commemorate someone who represents so much to so many people? One might consider a, a large bronze statue, the convention used to portray and celebrate statesmen or leaders. On the 4th of August 2012, this project was unveiled, marking the 50-year anniversary of what began Nelson Mandela's long walk to freedom. As you approach the site in the Midlands along the R103, the sculpture appears as an abstract array of vertical forms in the landscape. Upon entering the site and driving past the sculpture to the top of the hill, this abstract quality persists. 
From this point, you walk down the path that takes you back to the sculpture. This long walk is a symbolic journey over distance and time, a kind of pilgrimage, a metaphorical journey of reflection. The path cuts into the earth, creating steep banks on either side before it levels out and spreads, pushing the land forward to form a platform for the sculpture. As you descend further, the carved land compresses around you, creating a serene quiet directing your gaze forward. Soon after this, one reaches the focal point, where at a distance of 35 meters, the portrait of Nelson Mandela comes into being, the 50 columns lining up to create the illusion of a flat image. The sculpture is transient and delicate, an unconventional yet iconic monument. From the focal point, the repeated, repeated vertical forms create a sense of stillness and isolation. However, from uh, the other views, the design and arrangement of the columns forms a dynamic of movement, of fracture and release, spreading over 20 meters in length and rising to a height of 9.5 meters. This deliberate paradox represents the momentum gained in the struggle through the symbolic of Mandela's capture. The columns represent the 50 years since his imprisonment, but they also suggest the idea of many making the whole, of solidarity. It points to an irony, as the political act of Mandela's incarceration cemented his status as an icon of struggle, which helped foment the groundswell of resistance, solidarity and uprising, bringing about political change and democracy. This image documents the experience of people arriving, walking down the long path, pausing at the moment of recognition, wandering through the sculpture, and finally electing to use the site as a place of commemoration. Being persistent in responsiveness to ideas, questioning my role and exploring the possibilities, learning from and working with others has defined my work. I have been reminded of the power of communication, how art can enrich our experience, creating a sense of belonging and value. Thank you.